going on, everybody? It's your buddy, it's your pal, Spaz Phoenix, along with Kristen. We're back with the Flix Fix, and we are going way, way, way back with this one. Kristen, how are you? Doing good. <laughs> have controversial opinions. I was going to say, when uh, when I get you to watch a movie for the first time and your response on Messenger is literally, I've got opinions, which is an expression I use a lot, uh, you know it's going to be a good a good time. Um, anybody listening, anybody watching right now, if you're watching the uh, the live stream on YouTube, go ahead and look up uh, Spaz Phoenix Podcast on all your typical podcasting things. If you're listening to this in a podcast form and you want to find me on YouTube, uh, look up Spaz Phoenix on YouTube. And uh, specifically these movie reviews I'm trying to put out every Tuesday at about 9 p.m. Toronto time. So, 1970... As soon as I watch this... As soon as we, as soon as we finish this movie, I was like, "Oh, oh, the internet's gonna hate me." I don't think they will. 1979's, we'll 1979's sci-fi classic, Alien. That's exactly why I feel like the internet's gonna hate me because it is a sci-fi classic. I mean, if you and if, I did not like this movie. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm gonna watch the other ones because we do this, but this this was not. I was I was not having a good time. <laughs> you you, you walked away from this with the uh, this ain't it, chief. Exactly. So the other cool thing to mention before we start on all this is I have a huge gigantic box set of all the Alien movies. Some are good, some are not so good. We're doing the first three because those are the ones that are good. And I ended up watching the I think. 2003 director's cut thinking that you and I were going to have two different conversations and it turns out you watched the director's cut as well so we will in fact be on the same page Yay. this this movie folks if you want to do your math and then come back and make fun of me this movie is three years older than I am it's old um, and you can't watch yeah. it not knowing that it's old um I will say though when I watched it you know you, when you watch an old movie you expect it to like you know look like shit and uh I found out recently that because it was made because it was shot on actual film there's no like pixelation so you can like make these old movies in like fucking you can like enhance them to fucking 4K and shit so it did not it didn't look bad no, the quality of the movie itself doesn't look bad, but the the stuff in the movie looks old as hell. Yeah. <laughs> we're, and we're gonna we're gonna get there. The old, like art, the old like green text monitors and shit. <laughs> they're run, they're running DOS. It's fine. I will say though, the way it's and I mean like this is not me trying to be like super film nerd because that's not what I'm trying to do. The way this movie is shot and the way it doesn't do a lot of the things that most movies today do. Like, you watch Marvel. We've talked a lot about Marvel. Uh, all the scenes are sort of cut to hell to make it feel even more action-y than it is. Not not this movie. This movie... Nope. Even in the beginning... Um, I mean, anybody that knows about this movie when it first came out knows this was... And I'm not saying this just to pick on Kristen. This was a huge deal when it came out. I, I've heard my parents talk about this movie and how this was the thing at the time where it's just like parents wouldn't let their kids to go see it because there are a lot of horror movie elements to it. And like I could see this if we hadn't seen all the other things that we've seen since, you know, 1979. I could see this being a terrifying movie for some people. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I didn't find it scary at all. No? All right, well, fair And enough. I'm a giant Brady cat when it comes to scary movies. Yeah. I do like, we started it out, and the whole opening credit scene is so quiet, just like the camera itself is coasting through space, and then even when we get to the Nostromo, which is the titular craft in this movie, because nobody's awake yet, we basically get a, a slow sort of drifting tour of the ship via camera, which is really cool because it sets your it sort of sets your stage mentally for where all the crap's going to take care of later on. And if you look at any alien poster from back then, like the promotional posters, the theater posters, all of them said at the bottom, in space nobody can hear you scream. And that's punctuated by like the silence. Anybody now that's like modern days gone to see a The Quiet Place, which I think is an awesome movie, 
which is a pretty much silent movie, except when it needs to be loud, uh, can thank a movie like this for how they played around with silence, at least at the beginning. So, of course, we need an intro- we need an introduction to all these people, so it's a sci-fi movie. We're going to meet them as they're waking up from cryosleep. Yep. And it is a rule in science fiction movies that if you're going into cryosleep, you're in your underwear. Yep, yeah, basically. And I think we see Sigourney Weaver twice in her underwear. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to get to that, too. Um, but just, like, they're in diapers. And like, yeah, it's real weird looking. It's really weird looking. It's really like, ooh, it's science. We got to make it look different. You can't just have regular underwear. It's it's like they're all in diapers, and she has like a ribbon, like yeah, she covering. has like the smallest pair of underwear I've ever seen. Oh, I'm, I'm at the top even half. in this day and age. Yeah. Oh, you meant the top half? She's got like a, a, ri- a ribbon and around. Maybe I'm thinking about later. She's got a ribbon around her top half that basically just covers her nipples. It's like, eh, she's got a top. It's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, Sex appeal. Th- th- I mean, Sigourney Weaver's not hard to look at. I'm just putting that out there. But not the point. Uh, also, randomly, uh, I, I would imagine somewhere on the ship there is a little tiny cryo chamber. Because Ripley brought her cat. Yes, because there's a cat on there. Just, just, just cat. Probably for my favorite character of the whole movie. Yeah. Is the fucking really, cat. Is Jonesy. Yeah. Jonesy the cat. The um, cat is the greatest character in the movie, and not because he does anything in particular. Yeah, this cat. All the other characters suck. They don't all suck. No, I I'm Sigourney Weaver's fine. Everyone else, I I. I disliked very much. The very bottom of the dislike pile of characters is the other uh, female character who is the navigator, Lambert. Who's kind of useless. I believe is her name. Who's kind of useless. Oh, my God. She, she cries when I the situation gets upsetting so enough. Much. I was going to say, you're probably going to be better with names so than me. so much. The only names I really know are Kane, Ash, Dallas, and Ripley. I Just, was going to ask if you remembered any of their names. Because I had to look them up. Um, well, there's... Other than Ripley. There's there's the chick that's not Ripley, there's the two tech guys, and then there's Kane, Ash, Dallas, Ripley. A uh, little bit of trivia for you. I meant to get more trivia, but I didn't uh, I didn't think to go back to the What Culture video that had all the trivia on it. The character of Dallas, which is played by Tom Skerritt, uh, Tom Skerritt, back in the day, I knew from the old show Picket Fences... For anybody that knows what that show is, I'm just showing my age. It's fine. His role was almost played by... Uh, what the hell is his name? What the hell is his name? Han Solo. Uh, Harrison Ford? Yeah. It was almost Harrison, really? it was almost Harrison Ford. He was offered the role first. Do you want to know why he turned it down? Why? Because he had just done Star Wars... And his quote, he didn't want to be typecast as a sci-fi guy. Too late. <laughs> Actually, that's not entirely true, because he's been in other nerd things. Okay, other, other, other than Indiana... Okay, so he's just lived in the Lucas-verse. Uh, yes. Also, when the story was originally written, they were only, the story was only written with last names, so that all the characters in this entire movie could be played by male, female any person of any type that fit, which is why Sigourney Weaver That's cool. ends up... Yeah, so Ellen Ripley, uh, which I don't think she's ever referred to in this movie as Ellen, but she does get referred to in Aliens and Alien 3 as Ellen Ripley, cause, just because you see her IDs and shit. Uh, it was just written as Ripley. But when it was turned into a movie... That's, what, that's the only thing That's the only thing they're, they name her as in the Wikipedia page. Okay. Uh, the other thing that was cool, too, is they actually fought... Uh, internally about having her be the final character because the the cliche in horror movies of the final girl was becoming a thing and they didn't want to fit into a cliche so some creative forces within the the movie making process actually fought to have her be the main character slash soul survivor so uh, for 1979 that's pretty cool to hear yeah I agree I didn't know that um, well, again, 
I'm going to kiss all the asses that I usually kiss. Go check out people like What Culture that come out with little gems like that. So we wake up from the cryo sleep. We see Ripley's cat. Everybody's sort of bantering around the breakfast table. And their breakfast booth really does look like they're just sitting in a really shitty diner. I'm going to put that out there. The mm-hmm. two tech guys throughout this entire movie make it very, very clear that they are not happy with their paycheck. Like, yes, that are, is basically their main character trait <laughs> until the alien starts killing yeah, people. They're talking, talking about the bonus situation, talking about the share situation. And then Dallas goes and talks to Mother, which is the ship's AI, which is really just a computer monitor in a really, really shitty 1979 Cerebro. <laughs> Yeah, basically. Like, this is, it is, this, it is like, Cerebro this is really with, like, bad. extra lights and shit. Um, anyways, they find out they're nowhere near their destination. They aren't even in their own system. They've got a signal, an unexplained signal from an unexplored planet, and they have a thing in their contract that says it's mandatory that they go and check out, sort of, on... Un- Here's my first problem. Okay. The fact that right. they're like they're they're, they're like a pro, they're like a mobile processing factory in space and yeah, they have they're to like go... a mining thing. I cuz you know really what would happen is if we're looking for life out there, we don't just tell everybody like, "Hey, if you find life, you, you find a signal, you have to go fucking check it out." They would be like, "No, you make a note of that shit. You call like the proper authorities in that area and <laughs> yeah. let somebody with a gun with it." But, uh, but no, we're just going to send who the fuck ever to go look for alien life. Whatever. The greatest thing, though, <coughs> is the two tech guys that are arguing about their shares. Like, we're not doing this, we're not doing this, we're not doing anything until we talk about our shares. And then it's like, there's a clause in your contract that uh, if you don't go and do this this thing that's built into your contract, it, it, it's a forfeiture of all shares. And they all smile and laugh and do that, well, fuck me type thing. Yes. And they land on the planet, and the hall is breached, and the landing is rough, so clearly they're stranded, because it's a sci-fi movie, and that's what sci-fi movies do. <sighs> yes, let's send the most unex... Un, uh, I yeah, don't know. They send, who do they send out? They send... They send the captain? They, they send the captain? They send Kane. Dallas... What Dallas, Kane. I think, I, think it's, I think it's everybody... And the... Ne- and the fucking navigator i was gonna say it's everybody but ash ripley and the tech guys so it's the other three yeah, what is hang on, i'm trying to look up what kane's like fucking job is he's just executive officer he's just a guy and he's disposable well, anyway whatever that means um so they're looking they for the send, signal they send you know the two highest ranking people on the ship and the person that flies the ship because <laughs> it's, cause it's it awesome out. You know what it is? I I do. As it, it is Star funny. Trek level shit. It, red shirts, right? I'm like saying like in Star. Yeah, I'm saying like in Star Trek. Instead of sending like you know security guys, I know we're gonna send the captain, the first officer. Yeah. <laughs> down to the planet. But then the then. <laughs> You've got Ripley. Actually, I'm very support. I'm actually very surprised that they didn't do the movie uh, cliche of sending the black guy down to die first. Well, I mean, they're, they're boosting up the women. Maybe they're boosting up the diversity as well. But you have to have Ripley. Exactly. It's funny because the te- the two tech guys were complaining earlier in the movie about how nobody else is going to come down here. They're going to send us down here. And then Ripley's right down there with them. And they're still talking about it. if they find mm-hmm. what they're looking for out there, do we get full shares? And it's like, yes, it's in the rules. You're going to get paid. Why don't you fuck off? <laughs> and she just walks off. Sigourney Weaver is great in this. She's like... The hero of, like, obviously she becomes the hero of the movie, but she's, like, the badass of the movie without even really trying, just by, like, like mm-hmm. I said, like, she doesn't play a prototypical female character, like, she might as well be one of the guys, and I mean that in the most positive way possible, it's like, you guys are being idiots, fuck off and fix and the plus, ship. And plus, they already have the useless female in Lambert. Well, one step at a time. So they're going through the the planet and and they're exploring the surface and they're in their very very 1970s looking you know spacesuits and all that. 
And in the distance, you can see a ship, and if you've seen the shitty prequels, you know that it's the ship from Prometheus, and you know that there's a throne inside the ship that's got the creator's skeleton in it. And I don't want to you're talk. Now, you're now telling you're now telling me shit that I don't know because I didn't I... see Prometheus either. Well, it's basically Prometheus and uh, Alien Covenant sets you up for this, and it's just it's a stupid, convoluted story that I don't really like. But basically, it's somebody that's been a victim of or it's something that has been a victim of the aliens before them. They look at the skeleton, they realize the skeleton's been dead and fossilized for a long time, and what do they notice? They notice there's a burst in the rib cage, and it's a burst outwards, and that must have been what killed this thing. Meanwhile. Ash, who's this totally quiet, unassuming guy that kind of watches everything else happen. Gee, I wonder why. We'll get to that later. The signal wasn't actually an SOS. It was actually a warning. And, uh... It's like, hey, don't fucking come to this planet. Shit's fucky. Yeah, and it's it's the whole uh, the whole reveal of that is it's weird because it, it should be a big that should be a bigger reveal than it is in the movie. It's very different, mm-hmm. and, I, and I've, I think I've said this to you before, and we've talked about it before. It's very different watching a movie with the context of I got to come up with what I'm going to say about the movie, rather than just watching it for the hell of it. Because structurally, the fact that it's not an SOS, the fact that it is a warning, stay the fuck away, should be a much bigger reveal than it is. But they notice also, right next to this throne, this big dead thing that they've just found, there's also a melted hole in the floor. So clearly, let's go explore the ment- the melted hole in the floor. It's a good plan. It's there's a, a there's a lot there's a lot of this is a great idea. Let's do this. That's clearly yeah. not a great idea. So Kane goes down first, and long story short, he reaches the base of the ship, which has a big uh, what do you want what do you want to call it like a like a foggy shield over the floor. Yeah, and- it has like a mist. You know what? It, did you see the? Uh, did you see the, uh, the the megalodon movie Meg that came out? Like, yes. I want to say like a couple years ago. It reminds me of the like bullshit. Like that's not that's not the real floor. Oh, the a- the atmospheric barrier. <laughs> yes. In the water. <laughs> They're like that's not actually the sea floor, even though we've had things touching it and walking. Yeah, that's what it reminds me of. That's not the real floor. <laughs> Side note, I love the Meg. The Meg is just big dumb fun. <laughs> go go watch uh, the Meg. I do too. I th- I I think it's like stupid, but uh, but in like a good way. Being yeah. stupid. It it knows it's stupid. You, Jason Statham knows he's in a dumb movie and he's having fun in his. But it's got Ruby Rose in it, so I like Ruby Rose. Moving on, um, we go down into this other layer, and what it basically looks like from from a practical point of view is it looks like somebody's got a fog machine going and they're shooting some laser lights through it. That's what it looks yep. like. And you get—I mean, I'm sure that's what it is. At, I mean, that's exactly what it is. But you know, as for what it's supposed to be, it's it's an atmospheric thing protecting all the eggs on the floor of the ship, and of course, you know, alien eggs. Let's touch them. <laughs> This let's, is, t- let's put my face right up to it. This is the the grandfather of every other. I don't know what that is. I'm gonna go stick my face in it. I'm gonna touch it. I'm gonna scoop it up with my finger. Like well, this. I mean, the mysterious like the mysterious like signal that brings them to this planet is the stereotypical. What's that noise? Let's go check it out in every horror movie. For 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 fans of uh, Cinema Sins, you better come look at this cliche. <laughs> and. Not fully yet, sort of in shadow, sort of not completely revealed to the audience yet, but we are through Kane basically being the victim. It's really weird saying Kane because the whole wrestling thing, but I'm getting mm-hmm. over it. And we are introduced to the face hugger, which, corny or not, is one of the most iconic creatures in sci fi slash horror. I love the face hugger, I think it's <laughs> awesome. Um, which manages to burst and melt through his helmet. But helmet, yeah. Actually, I lied. The first, the my favorite character in this movie is, in fact, the cat. Second favorite character, the alien itself. The facehugger or the xenomorph? 
All of it, yes. They're basically the same thing. Well, they're two parts of the same species. Yeah, I love the facehugger just because exactly. the, the design of, of the facehugger. If you ever, like, look at... I've, I've done the nerdy shit, like, looking at concept art from when they were making the facehugger, and it is one of the cooler, like, creature concepts out there. Because basically it's two hands with a tail. Mm-hmm. But, um... But, yeah, so the facehugger goes through things. And this is where you get, you know, there's a lot of leaps in this movie. They had to get really, really suited up because the atmosphere was different and the air was different and they were, you know, exploring a planet. But yet they're able to fully, safely bring this guy whose um, face area and helmet area has all been completely crushed in by this alien facehugger thing right back to the ship. I know. Let's bring it inside. Oh, well, there's the, that's, that's where you, idea. That's where you, <coughs> that's where you get the debate. <laughs> between uh yeah, well yes this is where my immediate hate for lambert starts well she yeah well, she, that she, debate she she's reacting emotionally but the debate is really between ripley who's sort of in the cockpit who is first in command when dallas is off the ship i think is how it breaks down but you've got ash yes. ash who's at the door and he's making the case to let them in and Dallas is arguing with Ripley to let them in, and Ash just does it. So it almost makes you think, like, hey, you know, Ash was at the door. You could have just yelled at Ash, and, like, Ripley wouldn't even have been in the conversation. But, yeah, so this is the next big thing, and this becomes, like I say, this... You might not like this particular movie. Kristen obviously doesn't. But it does set up a lot of classic tropes that do work themselves into a lot of movies that we see coming out today. The whole, well, you know, we really, sh- like, the, the moral thing is he's contagious. He needs to stay outside. He's been contaminated. He needs to stay outside. Modern days, we would say he needs to social distance. But yes. they don't. because. They like but they don't because plot. And because... Much like in real life, the, the, the emotional tangent eventually does, uh, you know, overwhelm everything. They bring him in, they laser cut the helmet off, and you see the face hugger for the first time. And it is the, it is, like I said, it is one of my favorite monsters in cinema. Like, the alien itself, the xenomorph, when we, when we see it later on, is big and terrifying and, like, could crush your city, depending on which one from what movie you're talking about. But the facehugger, it just has something ab- about it that just I, I like, and there's nothing else to really go on with that. Everybody fights a little bit. You know, the other, the other woman tr- sort of tries to bitch slap... Um, Ripley, and they have Does a bit of bitch slap Ripley. Yeah, it's and it's I'm a... like, you. Fu-. That's her my immediate because I'm like, Ripley is the only one talking sense about why the fuck did we bring this thing in? Bring this thing in here. This is a terrible idea. We don't know what the hell it can do. Yeah, and and, and Ash, like, I think you're I... gonna leave him out there, slap, and you're like, oh god, you the, stupid idiot. The extra added, uh, the extra added fuel on the fire is that Ash, the one that actually decided to let them in, is their science officer. So the yes. person who should know more than anybody else that this is a bad idea is the one that decides to let them in. I wonder why. We'll talk about that later. Why? They try to move one of the fingers, and they even treat it like fingers, like all the little uh, sort of tendrils that like are wrapped around his head. Mm-hmm. And every time they try to take one of the fingers off, the tail that's wrapped around his throat, you know, does a thing. Tightens. And they have the uh, they have the debate of like, oh my god, that thing is smothering him. How is he breathing? They do a body scan. They find out that it's actually feeding him oxygen. And Dallas, at this point, he just has this sort of like stream of consciousness for a second, and he's like, you know, paralyzes him, puts him in a coma, but then keeps him alive. Now, who the hell does that? And then, as we learn more, they attempt to cut off one of the fingers, and then we get the reveal of the acid blood, and then the uh, the one tech guy. I like is how a- they chase it through the. I like how they chase it through the hole as it's like burning through, and then, and then they finally get it. And they're like, not trying to stop the hole. It's gonna breach the hole. Yeah, it it is funny because they are literally following. It's not a, try not to patch up any of these holes. Yeah, they are. They're literally going. They're, they're down literally following like a burn thing, right? Where it's dripping through. Which is which is funny, but they also like it is also an important thing in a way because like okay, if it'll burn through two holes and then it'll kind of fizzle out, that's cool. If we have to worry about it keeping on going and now we don't have a ship, that's not so cool. <laughs> 
And then yeah, there's just, a hole in the ship. And then, as if you need it punctuated, one of the tech guys is like, it's got a nifty little uh, defense mechanism. You don't dare kill it. And it's like, yeah, we just we just saw that. Like, <laughs> we get that. See, um, that's the immediate time I'm like, well, Kane's going back outside now. Yeah. I mean, this thing's keeping him alive, so it'll keep him alive over there, too. Well, it's keeping him breathing. I don't think it's feeding him anything. Like, considering, like, what they know at the time, right? Obviously, we know now that he doesn't make it anyway. I would be the cold, callous... I'm the cold, callous person that, during the zombie apocalypse, I'm like, you got bit, we're we're offing you right now. (laughs) Oh, no, for sure. No, you are absolutely right. I'm just saying, like, I could see the argument happening. Sorry about you, you shouldn't have... Sorry about you, you shouldn't have put your face in an alien egg, okay? That's your <laughs> fault. It's not my fault. You did that shit. Anyway, so we come back inside. We have a little bit of a discussion with Ripley and Ash. Ash is still looking at the scans, still looking at, like, samples and whatnot. I don't know what he's gotten samples of, because everything that he could scrape off of it is is corrosive. Like? Is acid. Mm-hmm. And so, but, you know, he has samples. Uh, he explains to her that it seems to constantly shed its cells and adapt to adapt to the new environments. It's, it makes it the most, yeah. you know, it's it's yeah, the perfect. Let's he, bring it on the ship. He talks about it, he talks about it like it's the perfect orgasm. He talks about it like it's the, the perfect orgasm. That's perfect. what he has when he talks about it. Well, true. Well, he does end up covered in white stuff later. Um, exactly. Oh, I forgot. Thank about you for that. pointing out my Freudian slip, though. That was great. The perfect organism. Um, Basically, how it's it's constantly regenerating its outer its outer body to con- contradict to the new environment. It's the perfect organism, and she's she she goes at you know if she was wearing glasses, she would have like taken her glasses off. And says it's almost like she would have. It's almost like you admired. She would have Sarazaw with the shit out of that. Sarazaw with the shit out of it, yes. But uh, basically, she discusses it with Ripley and Roddy Roddy Ra, and she basically shits on him for breaking like every law they have. And he, his response to her... Like, hey, we shouldn't have brought this shit in, and that's against protocol, and what the fuck are you doing? You and, know, stuff that normal people have a problem with. And the only response he has for you, for her is basically, you do your job and I'll do mine. And it's just, that is such a no... Like, yeah, at that point, point... You're not doing your job, fucker. Yeah. Well, with it being in there, he's doing his job now, as now? far as figuring... <laughs> yeah. So we flash to it's weird because they're they're arguing over Kane, basically, and then we flip to Dallas, who's called back to see Kane, which is where we just were. The scene kind of jumps a little bit. The face hugger is gone. Not only is it gone, but they don't. Not only is it gone from his face, but we don't know where it is. They go looking for it, and in one of the cheaper jump scares of the movie, it sort of falls out of the overhead compartment on Ripley and it's like shriveled and dead and whatever. Um, they make the suggestion that to do an alien autopsy and you know, as they're poking at it, like one of the, one of the tech guys is like, are you sure this is safe to do? It's like, well, he's dead. I'm pretty sure it's not a zombie. I'm like, it's very, don't it, know fucking anything. it could be a zombie. It's, it's, it's very casual. It's very casual. And Rip, Ripley and Dallas have the same debate, basically, that Ripley and Ash has had a minute ago in the sense of we need to, you know, we shouldn't be hasty. We should keep this on board. We don't know what it's about. Da, da, da. And she's like, no, blow it the fuck to space. Fuck out of the ship. I, I, Ripley's the only smart character. That's basically why I hated every character. I'm like, all of you are stupid. <laughs> Well, the whole movie is basically meant to say, like, look at Rip, look I, at Ripley surviving I with forget, all these idiots. I I forget what. Uh, correct me uh, if you if you know. I forget what reviewer uh, was talking about it this way. It reminds me of I think that he called it an idiot plot, where the plot keeps progressing because everyone's an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> like well, that's the only reason the plot progresses forward is because they're idiots. Well, it's kind of the not it, well, not, except not, that like not to spoil, but be, but also Ash is like totally working against them. Yes, for reasons that will be discussed in a minute. But it's like, you're right in the sense that it is an idiot plot. Everything progresses forward because everybody's an idiot. But it's kind of like um, my biggest complaint about Captain Marvel, for say was the fact that they didn't make her a badass by making her a badass. They made her a badass sort of by making everybody else around her really lame, 
which is not a popular opinion, I'm aware. In this movie, they make Ripley seem really smart and really useful by making everybody else around her really dumb. Stupid. <laughs> yes. I would have blown them all out the airlock. And one, okay, and Guess sort of... Guess what? You can go hang out with him. Sort of simultaneously, they, had, they decide to keep the alien on board, and they take off in the shuttle on the way back to the Nostromo. When they get back to the Nostromo, they find out... Great they, idea. They actually find out where they are, and they realize that they are ten months' travel away from Earth. Now, keep in mind, when they first woke up at the beginning of the movie, they thought they were back in their own system about to go home. Instead, they ended up over here. It was like a really bad retelling of Passengers. Um, the crew gets called to see Kane again. He's totally fine. He's up and about. He's got no memory at all. The crew goes to dinner, and you do get, for whatever bad you want to say about this movie, you do get what is pretty much universally considered one of the best science fiction movie scenes ever with the chestburster coming out of Kane and us, yeah. us meeting the Xenomorph for the first time. Now... I can't confirm this because it's only something I've heard, and I don't know how they would have done it. Apparently, they set up this entire scene, the effect, the prosthetic, and everything, without the rest of the cast around the table knowing that it was going to happen. Uh, they probably could have done that just based on the... It depends on how how the prosthetic was made, I guess, and how bulky it was. I just They probably knew he had some sort of prosthetic, but not how it was going to like work cuz he could have hit it under his shirt depending on how big it is. Yeah, but you got you've got the the actual automated alien itself, which definitely scurries across the table like a puppet on a stick. It really does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I I I love this movie. <laughs> But I pictured it, it, it going man. <laughs> it it, it sort of, it's it looks like a gigantic thumb that somebody painted a face on. It's fine, but it is it is <laughs> still it is still pretty iconic. And uh, considering like the whole mythology behind, it's I accept I accept it as a good janky. It's a good janky. It was a janky of the times. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, but just as far as like the whole mythology of the aliens and how they work and how you have to encounter this one before it puts the other one in your chest and the whole idea... I would also like to add that this is the scene where the black guy grabs the knife to kill it and they're like, no, don't kill it. What? It just burst out of one of our friends. Why would we not kill it? I think the I think the what they're going for there, and you're right, they don't do it very well. I think the mentality of it is, hey, it's parent creature bled acid maybe it's gonna bleed acid too it's already killed one of our friends but yeah, we don't want to know it'll bleed it on to kane it's fine <laughs> okay well kane is a lot less dense than the several floors that they had just seen melted i think that they were going for don't stab it we don't know what will happen rather than don't kill it it's such a cute little thing let's keep it as a pet no, I doubt they were saying keep it as a pet, but still, yeah. I wouldn't have listened. I would have been like, I'm killing that thing. I don't give a fuck what its ass blood is made of. So then, we have... You can study it while it's dead, Ash. There's <laughs> more of them on the planet. <laughs> you, you personally it's don't... Also, if you personally don't like the guy, you're like, fucking Ash. <laughs> Well, it reminds me, okay, and this will be controversial, too, because I, uh, <laughs> totally sort of not on topic. I'm also the type of person that whenever it's, like, I used to do archaeology for a really long time, and so you're out in the woods kind of by yourself a lot. And so, you know, we always joke that if we, I, we always joke that if we saw Bigfoot while we were out there, I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill it. And my friends would be like, well, what if it's, like, the only one of its kind? I'm like, I am not going to be one of those people that has a blurry fucking photo and being like, I saw Bigfoot. Nobody fucking believes me. No, I'm killing it, and I'm bringing it back. And I'm like, this is what the fuck I found. And then you get off the drugs and find out that it was just a really big monkey. Or a person in a suit. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not one of these people that is like... Like the big Bigfoot enthusiast, but I'm just saying if okay, I but if you're one, if you're okay, to be fair though, and, and, and we're really going off topic now, but if you are in an area where you think tourists are going to be looking for Bigfoot, m maybe don't go around dressed as Bigfoot. Exactly. It's like you've seen Zombieland. I'm right? just saying if I find a if I find a Bigfoot, 
I'm killing it if I can, because I'm not going to be the person that nobody believes. <laughs> okay, you've seen Zombieland, I would assume? Yes, love Zombieland. So, Bill Murray, dressed up as a zombie so he fits in with the rest of the zombies, ha ha ha, fine. Why would you legit prank somebody into thinking you're a zombie and not think you're going to get shot? That's what... Shot, the... exactly! Yeah. I don't Jesse, feel bad Je- for Bill Murray. Jesse Eisenberg. Then he got what he got. Jesse Eisenberg gets shot, or sorry, shoots Bill Murray is, is the headline there. But I mean, if you're if you're dressed up in a Bigfoot costume in an area where you know people are looking for Bigfoot, that's that's a little bit of Darwin at that point. Exactly. <laughs> Anyways, what so we just found out is that if I find Bigfoot, I'm going to kill it, even if it, even if it and if it ends up being a person, that's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> so we're killing the alien, we're killing Bigfoot, and we're possibly killing Bill Murray. Exactly. I, I, I'm the one that kills the alien, and they're like, no, we have to study it. Well, you can study it while it's dead. It's not going to be able to move around as much now. Anyways, bringing it back around, um, we have the small little scene where they wrap up Kane, they put him in the airlock, and I guess their version of burying somebody at sea is to just shoot them out into space. I love that Dallas is like, does anybody want to say anything while they're all like, they have to look at him through a screen, obviously, because they're not all in the airlock. Does anybody want to say anything? And there's this long pause where the where it feels like the movie wants somebody to say something, and then he just shoots out and nobody's said anything. Nobody gives a fuck. I'm gonna quote Cinema Sins again, just because I can, because I know there's somebody in the comment section that pointed out that I shouldn't be going to Cinema Sins for movie facts when I don't. So whoever you were, I don't remember. Hi to you. It's like, yes, I want to say something. Here lies a stupid scientist who didn't know when not to touch something. Thanks for touching an alien egg sac like a dill hole. Exactly. <laughs> like, this it would be the worst funeral ever if it was actually, like, a funeral. I'm just but, saying, I would be the person that's like, yeah, I have, I have something I want to say. We shouldn't have brought him on the fucking ship. <laughs> you Amen. got what you... Oh. People are going to accuse me of kissing what culture's ass again but they did a thing a while ago about uh what's your really bad really unpopular movie take and adam cleary chose to talk about my girl you've seen my girl i assume what a, yes what a weird thing to talk about but okay and he's like the main kid in the movie thomas J, got exactly what he deserved you're gonna go kick a hornet's nest when you're allergic to hornets you're a fucking idiot <laughs> Get out of here. Yep. <laughs> and that's basically what we say about Kane here. It's, yes. It, it's really, really good. Um, Fucking moron. And I mean, it's Except one of those... I would also include the rest of the crew that brought him onto the ship. Okay, but unless you want to, like, abjectly just decide to kill them. Like, they're not going out in the shoot right now. Well, well no, but I'm just saying, like, he was an idiot, and so are all of you. Because <laughs> now that thing is on the ship. Um, we do, we do get into sort of like the planning stage of the movie here, and here's where I do like an older sci-fi movie versus a current movie. In a current movie, in a current sci-fi movie, you'd have Tony Stark with his nanobots fabricating a weapon exactly designed to kill this alien in five seconds. Here, we have, they've retrofit uh, a battery pack into somewhat of a cattle prod that they can use to at least shock it in the right direction. They've taken a a bunch of other, uh, sort of monitoring equipment to build uh, a, a, some sort of checker for changes in air density to use as a as a ramshackle sort of tracking device. They've actually taken the things on hand and modified them into being the weapons they need. They just didn't go, like, you know, quote-unquote, go to the armory because that's where all our guns are. There's a little bit of thought into that, and I like that. And stuff like that is what you get in a movie like this versus today where, yeah, you know, we keep the guns in the basement. It's it's not enough to change anybody's opinion of the movie. I know that. No, no, it's, it's, it's fine. Let's keep going. You don't like it. That's fine. No, I do like it. Uh, I think it's interesting. And they and the one bit of advice is like, oh, it doesn't like changes in temperature. Oh no, that's that's when they Is go that in, later? that's when they go into their their next stage of, of whatever. Uh, they split off into two groups. We uh, Dallas and Ash and the chick that you don't like are in one group. Lambert. The other group, there we go. 
it's funny because one of my old principal's names was Lambert, so I should remember that because she was kind of a twat too. But that's another story for another day, or maybe not. Uh, Ripley and the two tech guys hunt it through some like random tech locker area, and they get the obvious jump scare of they think they found it, they think they found it, they think they found it, and it's the cat. Cat. And it scares the shit out of them, but also it runs away again. So they decide that somebody has to go get the cat because if they don't go get the cat, then it's going to set off the uh, the air density the mo- monitor checker thing that they've got. Uh, so out of the two techs, you got the you got the bigger jacked up black guy, and you got the other guy. Who, you got the guy in Hawaiian shirt. Yeah, who's really his creepy. Is, his name is Brett. His name is Brett, okay. You see, you're better with the names than I am, because you got the wiki in front of you, I think. Yeah, I, I have the wiki open. And see, I've just got my bullet points, and bullet points I didn't bother writing down the names. Kind of like King of the Monsters, because, you know, some of the characters don't matter. But yes. this guy, who's already a little got a little bit of a creepy vibe going, when he starts meowing and calling to the cat in the dark hallway... Just comes off like a creepy fucker <laughs> while he's looking I for the cat. I think he is a creepy fucker. I think I mean, that is his whole shtick. I mean, they don't ever do anything in the movie to like back up that idea, but it's just sort of it's there. Um, if anybody listening has ever seen the show Prison Break, he kind of reminded me of Theodore Bagwell, who actually was a pretty legitimate creeper. Uh, I don't think it's the same actor. Somebody can correct me down in the comments below. I know you will. Uh, the, the whole point of all this is he finds an alien skin while he's finding the alien skin. You have to look, because I forget it was there. Uh, he looks up into the cargo area where there's all these chains hanging and whatever, and the slick, black, new version of the alien is actually hanging in the chains. Uh, stands tall behind him for the first time. We get the first view of him for the first time, and we get the double mouth attack, which is the other iconic bit of the mm-hmm. of the alien theology is the big double mouth, sort of like big long insectoid head. Who and, do you think he reminded you of? Uh, the guy that was in what movie? It, no, in the show Prison Break. In the show Prison Break. Are you looking it okay. up? Okay, keep going. Yeah, I'm looking it up. I'm looking okay. it up. Now the best part of this, the best part of this, and what I'm sure you're going to remember from this scene the most is him basically getting eaten alive. But we're, but it's mm-hmm. happening off screen, and the cat's just he, like watching it. Happen. In prison the break. cat's just like <laughs> watching it happen. The uh, cat is the smartest person. He's like, I'm not, because f-. the cat sees the alien before he does, and he, he's like trying to call the cat to him, and then the alien like shows up behind him, and the cat's like, mm, no, motherfucker, and like doesn't come to him. I love, I love the, I love the implication of this movie. That a creature that big and presumably that heavy, not only that... But would not make a sound when it would, lands? Would not make a sound when it lands, but also would not make a sound hanging from all those loose chains. And it would still make less would not, sound... The chains wouldn't dangle at all? Chains wouldn't, wouldn't dangle, like, chains wouldn't each shake, other. chains wouldn't dangle against each other, and they make less noise than the cat. And cats don't make much noise. But that's where the focal point is. But then you get that foreground background thing where it's focused on him, and you just see the thing like coming down in the background. A lot of it is shot really well, but it's all undone. Mm-hmm. It's all undone by the inadvertent comedy of the cat just watching this guy get slaughtered and not really. The cat a fuck. being like, "That was your fault, motherfucker." <laughs> the cat. Okay, animals don't emote the same way humans do, but the cat's look on his face is like, "Well, sucks to be you." Yep, basically. Um, and I agree with the cat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, do, it does, without sarcasm, it sucks to be most of them by the end of this movie. Mm-hmm. But uh, the group gets back together once again to discuss what's just happened. They plan to chase the thing through the air ducts, which, again, is kind of practical. Again, when they discuss when they discuss things, it's very much from a what-do-we-have-on-hand point of view. It's, it's um, make the best of what we've got. It seems to be going in the air ducts, so let's do that. Um... Ash weirdly refers to the alien as Kane's son, which is a really off-putting reference. Yeah. Um, Sorry, that... I just realized the guy that played Kane is uh, John Hurt. Yeah. I did. He's the he's the same guy that if you if you watch Doctor Who is the uh, is the doctor that like killed all the Time Lords. I forget what doctor that was. What number doctor that was. Okay. 
you are no longer talking about my milieu anymore. I cannot contribute no. anything. I cannot contribute anything to a Doctor Who conversation. Uh, the new weapon. Uh, they call him the War Doctor. That's what number he is. Anyways, go ahead. Okay. So they move on. They're gonna they're gonna chase it through the air ducts. Ash is now calling it Kane's son, which is really weird. They're yeah, that's new- really weird and creepy. Their new weapon of choice is they're going to rig up a flamethrower, which is fine. This is where, as you said before, they make the uh, thing of, like, well, the shock. Yeah, that's fine. We're in, we're in space. Definitely we should light fires. This yep. is a great idea. I mean, I could make a really bad comment about how fire seems to fix everything, but I won't do that. They talk about how it being in small spaces hasn't, hasn't killed it. It's not scared of being shocked or traced or anything like that. What about temperature? We've got fi- We've got things that can make fire. Uh, Dallas is nominated to be the one to go through the ducks. So much like what uh, what you said at the beginning of the movie, let's pick the most highest ranking officer to be sort of the canary in the cave <laughs> to get mm-hmm. this thing down the air ducts. And it's kind of cool to watch them do it because it's very practical and it's very like as they go section by section, closing it off, closing it off. You can in your head. Imagine being part of that planning process where it's it's sort of like cutting off sections of a maze until you have no yeah. choice but to get to the end. Um, they lose it on the scanners for some reason that's not really, really explained. And then he comes around a corner, and there's a really bad part <laughs> where he comes around and he sh- shines the light in its direction, and it's sitting there like... <sighs> big arms out and uh it's sitting there like sup motherfucker i was gonna say surprise motherfucker but you beat me to it yes. and then we cut away and the implication is okay there goes dallas um the rest of them collect again there's a whole lot in this movie i will say looking at it from a critical you know i'm about to talk about it on a podcast point of view there is a whole lot of break up come back together break up come back together break up come back together uh, is th- this where is this where there's a part in the movie? I think it's uh, yeah, I think it's now. I think it's after Dallas dies where they're talking about like we we do things in pairs and blah, blah, blah. And we stay together and they all immediately go off by themselves. Yep. After having the discussion of we're all going to stay together and do things in pairs and blah, blah, blah. And then they all immediately walk away from each other. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much, but uh, they come back together again. Ripley sort of modifies, and I can't really explain how she modifies it because it's basically the same plan again. Basically, she's going to go up and continue the plan where Dallas left off, but she's going to go find out from Mother if Mother knows anything about why they're here and uh, why the company sent them there. And I love the other thing, too, that makes it seem all really devious, and I'm going to get into the morality of it later, but they don't ever mention the company. I think this is what will go on in later uh, movies to be called the Wayland Corporation. But this entire movie, they just call it the company, which makes it sound mm-hmm. really ominous for, for a good reason. Um, but she wants to know what the, what exactly the company knew before getting them to go out there. And she realizes, I guess at this point, because she's the next in command and Dallas is dead, she now has access to Mother. So she goes back into the really shitty Cerebro and, and you know, tries a couple times to log in and says, well, you can't get in here because you don't have the code. Would you like to override? She overrides and gets in anyways, which is fine. And then she basically asks for the specs of the mission. And it basically says, get the specimen, all other priorities, secondary, crew expendable. And... Then she fights with Ash. And oh, yeah, I think Ash knows this, too, because she, like, tries to talk to him first about it, and then she goes, I'm just going to go get my own answers from Mother. Yeah. So, like, Ash knows this knows this part of the protocol before, like, anybody else does. Okay, but I'm going to say something Which is here. why... It kind of re- it kind of reveals like why he was like so adamant about getting it on the ship. Yeah, and you kind of get a couple of reveals in one here. And again, if they had spread them out a little bit, it would probably be better. But any proper analysis I can do of this scene is overwhelmed by one question and one question that I've had the entire time that I've loved this movie because I do love this movie. If you're gonna try and kill somebody, which Ash does here because they get into a scrap. I- 
I the, think I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. I mean, there are way easier ways to kill somebody than rolling up a magazine and trying to stick a magazine lengthwise in their mouth, which any roll has a hollow center, and she'd still be breathing. No matter how tight you make it. Also, she can breathe through her nose. <laughs> It's just, it's just really silly. Yeah, it's it's an uh, an androids I thought, version. I thought that I thought that too. I thought that too. I'm like, she can breathe through her fucking nose. Yeah, I mean, she throw she she throws him. She throws or sorry, he throws her. I can speak. I swear. Up on. She does try and beat. He does try and beat the shit out of her first. And, like, throws her around and stuff. But when he throws her up on the table, she sort of lands perfectly. It's like when you're in a video game and the, and the computer sort of makes sure you land in the right spot so that the other guy can By hit By the way, did, you, did your version of whatever you were watching, probably did, did your version have... Because she doesn't get thrown on a table She gets when she's getting choked with the newspaper. She gets thrown on somebody's bunk. And yeah. in the background is the only thing I can see. Is all the nude just, magazines. Is all the nude magazines. I'm like, are we not going to address that there's just tits in the background? All right, we're just we're just mowing past that. Okay, cool, got it. And see, you know what, and I don't know whether this is true or not, and it doesn't matter to the movie whatsoever, I almost think that that's Ash's bunk, and just somewhere in his memory banks, it's like, I need to put some titties on my wall, because that's what human dudes do. Uh, Tra- Travis thought that it was the black guy's bunk. I, My boyfriend I, thought it was his bunk. They never address whose bunk it is. There, it's just there's just tits in the background. No, but I just and no, I, it's probably not true. I just love you know you know when you sort the of fill idea, in the gaps. The idea of like I need to be more human. <laughs> this is what humans do. Dude, dudes put up tits. I just, oh, it's it's com- it's social com. Anytime you get a robot or an alien's view of what humans do, it really is just a commentary on us and like the weird things that make humans humans. But anyways, somewhere in the middle of this fight, and I can I can never pinpoint it because eventually you do see the white stuff starting to come down his head, and it is the reveal that Ash, who's been sort of like this awkward emotional. Uh, emotionless character throughout the movie is a droid or a, a synthetic. Like an and- they, they say he's an android. They say he's an android. Um, what's his name? The the black tech guy just says, he's a fucking robot. He's a fucking robot. I think, again, uh, thinking forward through the movies, um, I think through the rest of the series, they refer to them as synthetics. I will say, okay. I, I, I should break this up. And I should have said this to you before we started this, but I don't think you would have watched the movie if I had. This movie series is very much like Terminator. I love the series. It really gets better with two. But you have to do one before you do two. Yes. So, so while no, I, I, would have, I still would have watched it, but yeah. I would have been less enthusiastic about the, the the second one's really the better one. <laughs> like, so you're telling me this one's shit? Is that what's happening here? It's not shit. It is... No, it's not shit, and I can also understand why people like it, but it was not for me. It was not. I do like the idea that uh, Ripley's, like, she's basically the main character. She's the character that I identify with, because everybody else is stupid. Yeah. No, this, this, what this one does is it introduces you to all the theology of the creatures involved, that, so that when we get to the next one, which we're going to do in two weeks... Um, it does allow you to, it allows the audience to have the same knowledge as Ripley. So while Ripley is trying to wake everybody else up about what's going on in the second one, you're with her because you know she's right. So this uh, one, this one needs to happen. It's, yeah. Hopefully it's not spoilery. I'm going to ask you a question sure. about the next one. If it's spoilery, then you don't have to tell me. Um, are they in space again in the yep. next one? Yep. If I were Ripley, I would never go to space again after this. Uh, Be like, fuck it, career change. She doesn't really have a choice. Okay, she doesn't? Okay. Uh, Because for her to make the decision of whether or not to go back to space, she'd have to get home. Uh, Oh, okay. There we go. (laughs) All right, well. I didn't. I, I didn't want it to be spoilery, but if I were her, I'd be like, "Guess what? This whole this whole career that I have 
that's not happening anymore. Yeah, no, it's very it's like much. Like you get your leg. It's like how most people, not all people, most people, if they got their leg bitten off by a shark, you wouldn't go less likely again. to go in the ocean. Yeah, no, when we get to, and we'll, and we'll talk about this too, because I do have comparisons. I very much compared the first one to the, the first three Alien movies that we're going to do. I refer to this one as a horror movie, the second one is sort of a, a monster movie, and the third one is a zombie movie, just in the, okay. way, in the way they're structured. Not that they become entirely different movies, but the way, you might not agree with me, but this one does feel more like a horror movie to me. The next one feels more like a monster movie. Okay. Uh, no, I can see that. Going on and on. But um, Ripley does play in the second movie the, um, you know, sort of the trope in most movies when either an alien is landed or zombies are, are becoming a thing. You know, there's like the first person that finds out and they're the ones that try to tell everybody else and nobody believes them. Yeah. She's very much that in the next movie. Okay. Anyways, so they fight, and, and he tries to do the thing with the magazine that we've discussed that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. He's apparently killing her because, you know, she doesn't know to I'm breathe. I'm sure it doesn't feel great. Maybe he's paper-cutting her mouth to death. <laughs> I mean, or maybe she just doesn't have Kristen there to, to remind her that she has a nose. But all, nose. The noise, all the noise has them come back, and I guess because he's the token black guy in the movie, he's got a baseball bat. <laughs> he just knocks Ash's head off. He and knocks his fucking head off, and his head... And it's just goo. How his, head, how his head comes off, it's like... It's not like, you know, when you think you would beat something metal, there's not, like, a dent. It's like, clearly this is how his head would come off. No, like what I you... love, and I will say, for anybody modern watching this movie now for the first time, I bet you laughed when his head was oh, already was falling back, did. and he tried to attack, and it's very obviously just a mannequin that she's pulled on top of her. <laughs> But he tries to attack her again, and it's kind of terrible, and that's, of anything else in this entire movie, that whole, like, let me hold this mannequin on top of me and pretend that I'm fighting, is the moment where I'd be like, okay, maybe I shouldn't have made you watch this. But they, but they fuck it up some more. And then five minutes later, they turn him back on. To, to yeah, they, re, they re-plug him in to be like, well, we're going to... Clearly, he knew what this thing was because he didn't want me to find out about it. So we're gonna plug him back in now that he's all. They they do just plug his like head in basically. They don't put him back together, which is what some horror movie would do. They just, like we're gonna put him back together. Well, they they, they, they basically stick like back in. they stick like a jumper cable in his throat. <laughs> exactly. Is what it, is what it looks like, and he talks and he basically repeats everything that um, he that repeats mother said. that mother said and. It's really bad because he, when he's talking, it's clearly like the actor with his head coming up through the floor because it's the head is meant to be planted on the floor. And then they kick it, and there's the obvious changeover to just being like rubber dummy head. And, and it's really bad. You, know, you, have to let, you have to let those things kind of go you do. based on the time. No, you do, but... I laugh at it because I'm. It's like we've we said before. It's like when you talk about your best friend and you know your best friend's great, but when he says something dumb, it's like yeah, yeah, I knew he was gonna say that. Well, it's like uh, if we go back, if we go back to a movie, to movies we have watched, it's like when Travis talks about the the Godzilla movies that are like the real hokey ones where they're like in a rubber monster costume and shit. And the city's cardboard. <laughs> exactly. It's like that, and you're like, I know it's gonna be hokey, but I like this movie, so. Oh, for sure. You know, you just I always deal laugh. With the level of hokeyness. I always laugh because I've loved this movie for as long as I can remember, so I can look at a lot of these movies now and just be like, holy crap! Somebody seeing that for the first time probably fell out of their chair. Because it is, it is bad by today's standards. Because we're kind of spoiled by what movies can do now. To be fair. But it, it is. It's like, here's the shot with him actually talking, and then there's an obvious cut where they, like, kick the rubber head. And then they come back and burn it, just so that everybody can feel a bit better. That's what I would do. That's yeah. why I didn't identify as, like, mm, yeah, well, fuck you, asshole. <laughs> burn yeah. your head. So there's a new plan now, because before, earlier in the movie, they were like, why don't we just abandon yeah, this? They yeah, Lambert, earlier in the movie, Lambert's like, we should just take the shuttle and get out of the Earth. And they specifically say the shuttle can't support four people. 
Yeah, but now... But now con- there's not four people! <laughs> I was gonna say, now, now, conveniently, enough people have died that we can do that. Um... Hello? Lambert's fucking awful. There we awful. go. I'm still... Lambert is fucking awful in this... I've, everything Lambert does annoys the shit out of me. I hate her so much. Yep. So you know what I... Okay. And Ripley's the badass, right? Yes. Tell me how the, they're going out for, like, cold fuel cells to, like, help the exploding of the ship, and she's going to go set the self-destruct things, and everybody's on their way, and they've got a plan, and they're going to take the shuttle, and they're going to blow up the you ship. You know, the plan where they, you know, they go and do the plan, ignoring the first part of the other plan, which was nobody go by themselves. Uh, and also the, pl- that. also the plan where Ripley sort of aborts the plan and goes to look for her cat. Yes. Because I'm sorry, if we if we were willing to chuck human beings, when you're getting to the point now where you're going to destroy the whole ship, uh, you might have to leave your cat behind. I don't know. I think I would go look for the cat, but B- before you'd look for people. But that's because I like the cat. I would look for the cat before I looked for anyone else on this fucking ship. Yeah, that's true. Um, that, that's just me, though. I don't. I don't have much to say about the next scene. It is just basically the alien knows that. The movie is almost over, so and so he's killed off everybody else. <laughs> kill, this is kill, when he kills the last two remaining kills. characters. Um, Let, Lambert dies. Kristen probably celebrates a whole bunch. I do. I do uh, celebrate a whole bunch. Thank God she's dead. I do like the double mouth attack because basically the second mouth kind of feels like a punch, and I just imagine it's just like punching every time it takes a bite out of something. It's. It does, and everybody's always said this about the Alien movies, it does really raise questions about how aliens eat, like what mouth gets the food, and like how does that all work, but I don't, I don't care, (laughs) because it's just awesome. You don't care about the alien physiology part? (laughs) I mean, I do like the alien physiology, but I don't care about its digestive tract. I I like the double mouth thing, I think it's awesome. Uh, and I think it's something that they have a lot of fun with when you get into sort of the the, the sillier movies, like the Alien versus Predator, because eventually you get the Pred Alien, which has like the double sucker mouth mouth, and it's it's very strange. Um, but yeah, so we so Ripley's on her own. She sets up the self destruct system. The system very loudly tells her that she's got ten minutes left. Um, she wanders- it also tells her how long she has to, um, to stop it. how long she has to stop it if she decides, eh, never mind, I don't want to abort. I don't want to yeah. blow up the ship. Which is a very interesting uh, setback. It's kind of like, I don't know why you would program it the- unless you did it on accident. I'm like, oh shit. Yeah. I mean, she has to like open it up, put in four big fuel cells, screw them in properly, turn on each one individually, and then like... She, the way she like the way they come up and she has to do something to them and then they have to go back down and they clearly have an automated way they go down but she thinks she's gonna make them go down like faster and she's just like, lean, leaning on them and pushing them down I'm like it's it's the me- mechanism of the ship you're not gonna change how fast it goes um, it's like the equivalent of when somebody gets in an elevator and they keep pushing the down button yeah it 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 is pretty much exactly that she goes to look for the other two crew members, finds them dead, wanders into some other alcove of the ship, and finds the walls crusted with people that have died a long time ago, like Dallas, and decides to waste all her time, like, burning that up, which... Maybe she's afraid that they'll be like Kane, and more of them will pop up. But see, here's my thing with that, though, right? And this, this is, this is me really nitpicking a movie that I love, um... It's played off, like, the way she sees Dallas and his head is still moving and he's basically like, oh my god, kill me, like, he's suffering type thing. The w- they play it off like she's got a shotgun and she put a bullet in the center of his brain to, like, put him out of his misery. Like, that's that's the imagery that they're going for, I think. But it's a blowtorch. That's a and really- she burns him alive. <laughs> that's like you're adding just pain on pain, but also the entire ship is going to blow up in five minutes. <laughs> Yeah, just let him die that way. Be like, like, sorry, bro. Like, I think it's going for the emotional punch. It's like the last guy in Skull Island that tries to save them all and cause the distraction, and then he just gets bitch slapped into the mountain. Like, it didn't yep. it, it didn't need to happen <laughs> at all. 
Um, if, Rip, if Ripley was really a bitch, she would have been like, this is all your fault. You're the one that brought this thing in here. Yeah, but they, but that's going to – like a statement like that or a moment like that is going to totally hinder – our cheering for her as the ultimate conquering final girl, whatever you want to say. I'm just, I'm just saying. Oh, I know. That's what I would you're, you're not, you're not wrong. Absolutely not. Um, this is all your fucking fault. They reach the 30 second mark. Uh, she gets on. The cat is with her. Uh, the shuttle detracts. Um, the ship explodes. And, be, and this is where I say it's definitely like going into your horror tropes. Because she's mm-hmm. exhausted. You know when like everybody has to have like their last one-liner before they pass out after they've survived something really drastic? She's like, I got you, you son of a bitch. So immediately the audience is like, did you though? Did you? But did you? <laughs> also, there's a couple minutes left in the movie, so <laughs> probably not. Well, okay, to, to be fair to them, in the theater people didn't know that back then. Yeah. Um, in the theater, also back in 79, people were not ripping it the way we are now. <laughs> Um, it was obviously, back then. obviously, because we're going to hypersleep, uh, Ripley has to get back into her underwear before they reveal that she the... puts the ca- well. First, she puts the cat in stasis. I love the I love the technology that acknowledges both the human and feline anatomy to put them both to sleep a proper uh, properly. Properly, yeah. For the trip home, because uh, you know to put a person and a and a feline in the same in the same chamber, mind you. Uh, for what is it? They said they were like ten months away. That's yep. that's that's very two different sets of physiology to deal with for ten months. Uh, obviously, like I say, because she's going into hypersleep, she's got to get back into her underwear. As you mentioned before, very very tiny weird underwear. Like it, very... it doesn't even like cover her ass. It, like <laughs> also, I found out that this is where Sigourney Weaver has no ass. She's just flat ass. <laughs> Um, you know, that's an odd comment, <laughs> but she doesn't have an ass. Sigourney Weaver has no ass. Unless she used a stunt butt. It's not butt. her fault. She could have, maybe she needed a stunt butt, but still, Sigourney Weaver has no ass. It's just, like, flat. And then we have a p- thing that drags out more than I ever remembered, right? Because you have okay. the, you have the awesome parts of a movie in your head when you when somebody says alien okay I think of the first chest burster I think of seeing the face hugger for the first time I think of the first big attack with the big mouth and all that sort of thing I don't picture the alien sort of lying down on a shelf for a oh lo- yeah and his for, arm like ding, it's for, like rubber arm for, <laughs> but I don't picture it like hanging out on a shelf for a long period of time, just like it was Waiting an extra... for her to get naked? No, it, it looks like the movie's over, and they put the literal alien suit up on the prop shelf. That's what it looks like. And then she's got all this time in the world to, like, get into her spacesuit and and do the... Forces the alien out from the wall with some sort of steam thing. I think it's supposed to be, like, a, a steam pipe or whatever. It, it's not really explained. Because she's got nobody to talk to anymore... There's there's less of a of a of a window in to like what she's planned next because the way you build that in is to have her tell somebody else what she plans to do. There's nobody there, but some sort of mechanical thing happens and the steam forces the alien out of the shelf and forces it towards the airlock, and it gets blown out into space. Which, again, going back to Marvel, is all the references that Spider-Man makes to Iron Man in. Infinity War when they blow uh, what is it Ebony Maw out of the ship? Yeah. It's like, remember that? Remember that really old movie Alien? That yeah. really old movie Alien? <laughs> yeah. And it's and it's good. It it is kind of awkward. And again, uh, throw it to my nostalgia and things I don't quite remember to just see the dude in the alien suit sort of like flailing on the outside of the ship before it moves over into the thruster and gets like like basically thruster fucked into space. And then just, yeah, we have the cool final narration where she she's giving the Makes little... Makes her last, like, video audio log kind of thing. Yeah. Like, everyone fucking died. Everybody died. I'm on my way to whatever. I should be in the system within six weeks. And then the final line is... Um, how does the final line go? This is Ripley, last survivor of the Nostromo, signing off. Which mm-hmm. is... I don't, I don't know how... Like, it sort of sums up the whole movie... But that sort of, like, became the quote that was pulled from this movie for a long time. 
and was used obviously in in advertising material for the sequels and and roddy roddy ra but it's just it's very like there's no celebration that she won there's no breakdown over what she's lost she's just very monotone and factual and quiet so the movie sort of comes it in makes with, me feel like it makes me feel like she didn't give a fuck about any of them or, or well either she didn't give a fuck or she was really numbed by the by yes. the experience but it just as an arc as you look over the whole movie cuz as i say like when it was advertised it was the whole thing was in space nobody can hear you scream like what's happening to them is a huge gigantic drastic thing rest of space didn't give a shit about mm-hmm. what just happened with them so it it sort of exemplifies like the irrelevance of it in the grand scheme of things and you have that at the beginning of the movie when it's just the camera panning through space and then just panning through the empty ship and now just like to have it like she didn't even defeat it she just sort of like blew it out the door it's, it's like so, somebody else's problem now well it's like let's space deal with it you know dr strange never beat dormammu he just annoyed dormammu until he went away well, this was the, like, let gravity decide it version of that. Yes. And, I mean, there's a lot, and as you said, I, I expect to get another message in two weeks telling me you've got much more opinions. There's a lot to pick apart, and this movie is very, very, very 41 years old. But there's also... I, it was very hard for me to like any of the characters, which was why I don't think I like... Other than Ripley and... She, as much as you, as much as I like identified with her, my like for her did not surpass my dislike for basically everyone else. Because yeah. you know you had the two engineering guys that the black guy gets better at the near, near when once all the shit starts and he's past his only character, his only character flaw, his only character uh, trait of I want more money. Once yeah. he's past that, he gets a little better. I do. Th- uh, I do think it's kind of cool though to see them as like they're not. I don't want to. I don't want to compare them to like janitors, but they are like the help on the ship. Yeah. So you've got those characters that are like, I don't care what all the bitching is about. I don't care what all the squawking about is. I don't care about what all you guys are arguing about. I don't know. I don't care what the company's agenda is. Just, just tell me what I'm doing and pay me. And you need to have some characters like that, and they end up being the two more lighthearted characters of the movie and if I, I think if you didn't have those two guys there to break it up a little bit break up the tension and whatnot mm-hmm. i think this movie drags a lot more yeah i was i was very underwhelmed by a lot of the characters and like dallas just seems like the dude that's just like fucking whatever i just want to i want to just want to get this done and he just seems like he doesn't even want to be here kind of thing Kane, I don't really get much of a sense of his character. He's well, just he's... the guy that ends up being the face, being face hugged. Lambert's fucking annoying as shit. <laughs> I think Dallas being an ineffective leader inadvertently gets you even more behind Ripley and gets you a hundred percent on board with her when she takes over because holy fuck, she's better than him. So I think, yeah. to like, I don't think he's a bad leader per se. I think he's reacting emotionally rather than factually, obviously, with the whole decision to, to uh, bring Kane back onto the ship and whatnot. Um, but overall, even though you understand the decisions that he makes, you know that they're wrong. So when you got Ripley, who has shown herself to clearly have a better head on her shoulders than that authority figure, when she becomes the authority figure, it's almost like the movie itself is in better hands. I just, I, it was very hard for me to like any of the characters, even in the, uh, even in, in like, you know, the Godzilla movie that we talked about that I didn't like the characters either, you know, because they're I liked shitty Godzilla people. in it. Yes. Yeah. Cause they're all shitty people. And then I liked the characters in, uh, in, um, Kong. It's hard for me if I don't like the characters, which is why I've never been a fan of like, uh, I'm trying to think of something modern. Like, a lot of people like uh, House of Cards from Netflix. Yeah. And when I can't like the characters at all, I don't want to watch the show at all. Like, they have to have some level of redeeming quality for me, and a lot of these characters don't have a redeeming quality uh, for me. 
I like House of Cards because House of Cards kind of lets you like the bad guy if you want to. House of Cards, House of Cards, re- um, regardless of what happened with Kevin Spacey in real life, uh, is sort of a choose your own asshole show. <laughs> well, and I mean, it can all be summed up with when we talk about I like Captain America and you like Iron Man. Yeah. So clearly, I like I need a likable person. You you need somebody on the on the super moral right. Yes. Yeah. Whereas I and I don't feel like anyone, even Ripley, I don't feel like anyone on here is super moral right. I mean, she's she's as right as she can be within their particular situation. She yes. obe- she obeys both their internal laws and basic logic and is able to be entirely cold to the emotional ramifications of that because the emotional ramifications of that is they leave behind one of their members to die and like let's not mm-hmm. let's not pretend that the emotional ramifications of that aren't there it's just that they don't trump facts they don't trump safety they don't trump law they don't trump yeah all that kind of thing I don't know. Um, if it's strictly character-wise that pulled you out of this one, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that's going to turn around in the second one. Okay. The second one... Well, that I, I could say that it was strictly the character Okay. that pulled me out of it. Because, so, you know, you kind of... In some of these, you kind of want... In, like, a scary movie, especially a monster movie, there you know, there's always going to be some characters that are like, yeah, fucking die, asshole. But yeah. most of them you, like, want to survive because that's how you, like, stay on the edge of your seat for, your, yeah, for the it, whole movie. And I didn't really give a fuck if anyone survived. And also, it doesn't help that even though I've never seen this movie, you've seen this movie. Like, you know the tropes yeah. of the movie. We talked about that before so we you came know on. It's like, Weaver. Yeah. Yeah. You haven't seen Star Wars, but you know... You, what you've Star- watched you, Family you, Guy. Everyone has, like, a vague, like, eh, it's about space, and Jedi, and Luke Skywalker, whatever, you know. Yeah. Or in and the case uh, of Star Wars, they literally retold the story on Family Guy. Exactly. But, but I and think so, even if you haven't seen it, Alien, you know the... culture f- thing, I know that Sigourney Weaver, like, lives. I know that Ripley lives because ne- she's in the next movie. Yep. And... So, you and know, you've the probably one seen some. I, like, I already know who's gonna li- who's gonna live, and I don't give a fuck about anybody else. So yeah, and most people know, or at least have an idea of the the basic alien with with the double mouth and the the face hugger, which, as I say, like basically looks like two hands with a tail. Uh, Mm -hmm. so the imagery of that is sort of all over the place, and you do, I mean, I didn't watch this, obviously, when it first came out, because I wasn't alive, but I saw these movies pretty early in life, so it does make a difference that you're seeing this movie for the first time in 2020, Mm -hmm. when we do have big gargantuan movies. I feel like, because, yeah, because of that, I feel like some of those lose its, like, horror effect right because i already know what the alien looks like i already know it has like acid blood you know like the vague understanding of it so there's no real surprise you're not surprised along with the characters about this thing and you don't care about the characters like a lot of fear in movies comes from you don't want something to happen to x character so if there's no characters that you're worried about then you're not worried about anything happening it, I think had I not known anything about this movie, I probably still wouldn't like the characters, but I would have been, you know, wanting Intrigued. Ripley to live. Yeah, I mean, and if you, so I if you didn't you know, know that there was, sort of... if you didn't know that there was two other movies coming along. Yeah, exactly. So some of my some of my not liking this movie, I can heavily say is because I watched it in 2020. And am aware of nerd culture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even you might even get a lot of this movie if you've ever watched The Big Bang Theory. Or watched mm-hmm. any any show that has, like, that one prototypical nerd character that made some offhand reference. Anyways, now, I think... I have it... not seen the second one. In fact, I was like, what part of the movie does Ripley get into, like, the big, like, astromech? suit thing. Oh, the mech, the mech loader. 
Yes, and Tr- yeah. this is like that's that's not this one. That's that's the next one. I'm like, and okay, see, so, so I don't know much about the next one at all. So it might be better for me. I see as soon as you mention, I don't know. seeing as this is an audio platform, you can't really tell. But as soon as you mention the mech loader, I get a big smile on my face because that's just fucking awesome. And there's a lot more of like just awesome shit that'll make you smile in the second one. There are some way better fleshed out characters in the second one. It's a little more fun. The second one okay. is a little bit more fun than this one. The third one's a little more intense with not so much fun, uh, but the intensity makes up for it. Uh, but I guarantee, if nothing else, even if it's, like, by 0.1%, you will like number two more than you like this. Well, and because all of the, like, laid-out foundational stuff happens in this movie, all the stuff I know about Alien, other than, like, the fight in the in the in the suit, in the mech suit thing, yeah. uh, apparently happens in this movie. So I literally know nothing about the next one other than Ripley's in it. So nice. I won't have as many... Um, spoiled elements. Yeah, spoiled elements to it. Because I already know that the alien's in it, because that's what this movie establishes. Yeah. And plus, this this movie only has one. That's the other downfall, too. So it's a... Alien. Alien, and then aliens. aliens. And that was the other thing we made fun of before we came on today, is, like, Alien, Aliens, Alien 3. So when you're having that conversation, it's like, Alien or Aliens? Because <laughs> one of them is good, and the other one is not. <laughs> It's, 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 Sorry, it's, I know I know Spaz really likes this one, but yep. I'm, I'm giving it a big old. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I'm not even going to say you're wrong. This this series does suffer from Terminator syndrome. Sort of slog your way through the first one, and then the second one is great. I think that's about all the all the manure that uh, we have to sling on this. So why don't you tell them where to find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Black Cat Feline. You can find me on Instagram also at Black Cat Feline. Mostly it's just bullshit pictures of me at work. Nothing wrong with that. It's mostly me plugging my channel on, on my Twitter. Anyways, guys, I was I was gonna sign off before uh, saying this. Um, we're still we're still in COVID. The world's kind of shitty. Depending on where you live, the world's real, real shitty right now. I really do hope all you guys are doing great, especially my friends in America right now. I know you guys are going through some some pretty crazy shit. So just know that I'm up here. I'm thinking about all you guys. You need somebody to talk to. My DMs are always open. We're going to get through this eventually. I'd really love to fast forward to 2021, but that technology doesn't quite exist yet. But uh, guaranteed, if nothing else, there'll be me, there'll be Kristen talking about really old movies and Kristen telling me how bad my choices are. Anyways, I've been Spaz, she's been Kristen, this has been Flex Fix. <laughs> Subscribe up there, talk down there, start a conversation, keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I will talk to each and every last one of you later, but for right now, myself and Kristen are out of here. Bye, guys. Bye. Don't shine, don't breathe like me. Don't apologize, they can hold you down.